we are now going to look at the pipeline data path and see how registers can be inserted into the data path to permit the use of pipelining. We are once again going to focus on the five stage pipeline. Just to recap, the five stages are IF, instruction fetch, read from instruction memory, ID, instruction decode, read from a register file and perform the decode logic, EX, which is the actual ALU execution, MEM is data access from the data memory, and WB is write back, update the value in the register file. This diagram shows what a single cycle data path would look like. The components over here are essentially corresponding to the instruction memory at the leftmost side, the register file, the ALU, the data memory, and finally, the multiplexer that decides whether it's the data value, data memory output or the ALU output that needs to get written back into the register file. The individual components we will be looking at in more detail. The main thing to note over here is the presence of these two feedback paths. What we will be doing in the process of pipelining is to insert registers between the different stages and see how the entire operation can be synchronized in such a way as to get appropriate results. So this is the same data path as before, but with the addition of several stages of registers as shown marked in blue. The registers themselves are labeled, for example, IF slash ID to indicate that it's a register that separates the instruction fetch stage from the instruction decode stage. Similarly, ID slash EX, EX slash MEM, and MEM slash WB. There's no separate register after the WB stage because the WB or write back is essentially the end of the instruction. What goes into these registers? You will notice that all the data which needs to go from left to right essentially terminates at a register. So for example, the program counter which might be needed in order to compute a subsequent branch instruction needs to be stored into the registers and propagated with the registers forward. Similarly, the instruction itself also needs to get stored into the registers and needs to propagate along with the registers or at the very least, the decoded part of the instruction, which you can see over here, gets stored into the registers and some part of this may need to get propagated further down the line. For those of you who have seen pipelining applied in different contexts, in particular in the context of signal processing systems, you may recall that pipelining is typically never applied when you have feedback loops. Whereas over here, we do have two feedback loops, one corresponding to a branch instruction and the other corresponding to the write back. What this means is that the pipelining as applied in the context of a CPU needs to be done with care. It, it is not the simple feed forward cut set kind of pipelining that is applied in the case of signal processing systems, but actually takes into account what is happening at each stage and is actually modifying the behavior of the CPU in such a way that the overall final behavior is as desired. So let's walk through a single instruction and see how it goes through each of the stages in this pipeline. The very first stage would correspond to instruction fetch. What happens in instruction fetch is that the program counter value is fed to the instruction memory. The instruction memory reads out a value and that output goes into the IF slash ID register. Note that that's all that happens within this clock cycle. In parallel, of course, we assume that the computation of PC plus four, which is required to get the next address from which to load the next instruction has been computed and is present at the input of the MUX. As a result, the next instruction will be loaded directly from this next location in memory. What happens in the case of branches, we will look at that later since as we know, the decision on branches cannot be made within the single instruction fetch clock cycle itself. The next stage is instruction decode, which in our case is primarily a case of getting data out of the registers or accessing the register file values. What happens to those register file values? They are taken out of the register file, but once again, they just get stored into another set of registers, the IDEX register. In parallel, 
the immediate generation, if required, will happen. And any other control logic that is required may also be computed over here. Note that all of these values, the immediate value and any control logic that gets computed, also needs to get stored in the IDEX register so that when we move forward to the next stage, the appropriate control logic required for this particular instruction is present at the ALU. Moving on to the ALU stage, the instruction itself, what needs to be done, the opcode, as well as the register values are all in the IDEX register. They get fed to the ALU. The ALU performs the appropriate operation, generates an output, and stores it into the ex slash mem register. In stage four, memory access happens. In this case, I'm assuming that the instruction that we are looking at is a load type of instruction. What this means is that the address, which would have been computed by the ALU in the previous clock cycle, is now got from the ex slash mem register, fed to the data memory. The data memory gives the output, that is to say the read operation is performed, and the output coming from the data memory then goes into the mem slash wb register. Finally, in stage five, the value which is present in the mem slash wb register goes through a mux. The mux essentially needs to select whether the previous instruction or rather the instruction that is currently being executed was a load instruction, in which case it is the data that just came out of data memory or an ALU type instruction, in which case it would be the data that was generated by the ALU two cycles earlier which needs to go back into the register. The value that needs to be sent to the register itself is selected by the MUX and is applied to the register file. As you can see, this sort of points backwards to a previous clock cycle, but that's not really correct. A better way to visualize this would be to think of the right part of the register file as being executed in this clock cycle. The reason why this edge goes backwards is because of course there is only one register file and we need to be able to both write to it and read from it in a single clock cycle but corresponding to different instructions. If you look carefully at this you will notice that there is a problem here. We will get to what this problem is with regard to the load instruction in a short while and how it can be fixed. Instead of load, if the instruction that we were working with was a store instruction, the only thing that would change would be stage four, where instead of reading from data memory, we would actually try and update a value in the data memory. That is to say, a store operation would be performed. The value to be written, as well as the address into which to write, would both have already been computed and would be present in the ex slash mem register. Now what happens in the write back stage of a store instruction? Nothing. No registers need to be updated. The register file is untouched by a store instruction. And therefore, the store instruction by itself does not need to do anything in the final write back stage. However, it cannot skip this stage. It is not as though this stage could be used by some other instruction in the meantime. So this brings us to the problem that was there in the load instruction. Remember that the output of the data memory needs to get written back in the write back stage. The question is, where should it be written back? And of course, the answer is it should be written into the register pointed to by the load instruction. If we are not careful, we could have found that the address that is fed to the register file would actually correspond to the present instruction in the decode stage. In other words, the RS1 and RS2 correspond to the instruction that is currently in the instruction decode stage. But the RD should come from the load stage. That is to say, it should actually come from the load instruction, which is currently in the write back stage. How is this accomplished? We basically take the part of the load instruction corresponding to the RD address and make sure this also gets forwarded along with the other load instruction data all the way till the write back stage, at which point it comes back to us telling us into which register we need to update it. Of course, this is also a very neat solution. We don't really need to do this only for load instructions. Any instruction, including ALU instruction that needs to update the register file 
will do that update only in the write back stage. So all that we need to do is to ensure that the RD, the address into which we are trying to update the register file, always comes to us from the write back stage, having been forwarded there stage by stage through the individual pipeline registers. This diagram is a common way of representing the execution of different operations. In this case, we have a program execution sequence, which corresponds to a load followed by a subtract, an add, another load, and another add. As you can see over here, if you look at this diagram, it shows the various different kinds of operations and which parts of which instructions are active in each of these. For example, we can see that over here, we have a load instruction where the data memory is accessed. The other important thing to note over here is the register file. In the same clock cycle, cycle number five, we have one cycle reading and the other writing. The load instruction is writing into the register file, whereas the next load instruction is reading from the register file. In our case, the target of the first load instruction is not used by the next load instruction. So there is no conflict or we don't really have a problem with the read after write as such. All that needs to happen over here is that they're accessing different locations inside the register file and they will get the values back correctly. Since we had designed the register file to be a read after write operation, we would find that even if there was a data dependency, that is to say the target of the first load instruction was being used in the next load instruction, we would find that because of the read after write operation, the correct value would then be used. The important point to note over here, of course, is the fact that the register file itself is being used in two different contexts within the same clock cycle. You'll also notice that the DM stage, for example, is idle for the add, subtract, and add instruction, whereas it is, of course, used for the load instructions. An alternate and slightly simpler to draw at least version of the same diagram just uses blocks to indicate the instruction fetch, decode, execute, data access, and write back. But it is not as clear as the previous diagram in terms of indicating, for example, the fact that there is no data access operation corresponding to a subtract or an add. However, this diagram is a little more compact and in general easier to draw and we'll be sort of mixing between the two wherever there is no source of confusion. So let's now quickly look at the utilization of the various stages. This shows one snapshot through the entire processor corresponding to cycle five. In other words, in cycle five, all the five instructions that we had started with have already made their way into the processor. The very first instruction the load instruction has already reached the write back stage. The second instruction, which was a subtract, has reached the mem stage, where of course it needs to do nothing, but still needs to propagate through this before it reaches write back. The third instruction add is currently in execution. It is what is making use of the ALU. The fourth instruction has just reached instruction decode and is getting the register values, whereas the fifth instruction is just being fetched from memory. What you can see over here is as a result of having this architecture, each of the different stages is occupied with some instruction or the other. In some cases, it may not actually be doing useful work as in the case of the subtract instruction in the mem stage, for example. But overall, this pipeline structure ensures that there is a regularity in the execution of the various instructions. And we can avoid any conflicts in terms of multiple instructions trying to access the same hardware resource. So to summarize, the way that the pipeline data path is constructed is we identify the different time consuming parts of a single cycle CPU, break it up into appropriate stages, place registers between these stages and the important parts of the instructions that are required for the different stages 
have to be carried along with the instruction and the corresponding data through the registers that are placed between the different stages. These registers could be fairly large. For example, we might have to store two register values that have been read between stage ID and EX. And similarly, we may also have to store a number of control signals between the ID, EX, MEM, and WB stages. However, the implementation itself becomes fairly simple once we consider that all that we need to do is make sure that the appropriate values themselves need to be stored into the registers and all communication between the different sections happens only through these registers. There are additional complicating factors that come up when we try implementing a pipeline control. That is to say, when we start implementing the control corresponding to this pipeline, especially when we want to do additional topics such as forwarding. But this structure does make it fairly straightforward to implement many of these things. We will be looking at those in future videos.